Between January 25th and January 27th of 2011, a blizzard swept across Pennsylvania, sending school kids, teachers, and the community home early in order to stay home and stay safe and warm. On January 26th, 2011, 27-year-old Ellen Greenberg, a first grade teacher at Juanita Park Academy, left the school after making sure that her students got picked up by their parents and everyone would get home safely. She left and made her way home in order to stay home and safe and warm from the blizzard. And her home was at the Venice Lofts in Maniunk. She carefully navigated her way through the blizzard and decided you know what, let me stop for gas. And she actually filled up her gas tank that day. She also called a restaurant, but it's not confirmed whether she made an order or canceled an order or what the call was really about. She got home and went up to the sixth floor, which is where her apartment was, and entered her home. And her fiance, Sam Goldberg, was also home early that day. Sam Goldberg was 28 years old, and the pair had been dating for about three years and had recently gotten engaged. They were set to get married in August that year, and Ellen was so excited about it. She'd already been picking out her dress, she sent out the the save-the-date cards, and she was busy planning everything. Sam Goldberg was a TV producer and for NBC, so that's a pretty cool job that he had, and eventually also for golf.com. At 3.47 p.m. that day, after Ellen had gotten home, she had sent out a text message to a family member, and then there's some activity that happened on her laptop for a bit. That was around 4.46 p.m. And by 6.40 p.m. that evening, Ellen was pronounced dead as a result of 20 stab wounds to her head, neck, chest and torso. What seemed like an obvious homicide case spiraled into a case that has baffled her family, friends and really the world for 12 years now. Her death was ruled a suicide and her parents have been fighting so hard for justice for their only child Ellen in order for her cause of death to be ruled even just undetermined rather than suicide. Because once you learn all the facts, it makes no sense that she did this to herself. But let's hear all the details of the case, and then you can decide if you want to help out to sign the petition that her parents have, to follow their Facebook page, and to show them the support that they need. I'm looking at her right now. She, I don't, I can't see anything. She didn't, there's nothing broken. She's bleeding. Ellie. Ellen Ellie Ray Greenberg was born on July 23rd, 1983, in New York, and she was the only child of Joshua and Sandy Greenberg. Joshua was a periodontist, and her mom Sandy was a dental hygienist. And yes, Ellen had a beautiful smile and beautiful teeth. Friends and family have described her as kind and nurturing, so it makes sense that she was a grade one teacher and she absolutely loved kids and was so looking forward to having a family of her own one day. Ellen had initially studied to become a speech therapist, but then throughout those studies, she decided, you know, this is not really for her. So what she did was pack up her stuff and move to Philadelphia, get her teaching certificate, and then she started teaching grade one classes at Juanita Park Academy. Around 2008, she met and fell in love with a man named Sam Goldberg, the TV producer with NBC. They got engaged and they were going to get married at the Hershey Hotel, an opulent landmark hotel where Ellen's dad said she was planning to invite plenty of family and friends to celebrate the special occasion with them. Ellen had already sent out the save the date cards and she was so excited for that wedding. In the weeks leading up to January 26th, 2011, Ellen was starting to experience increasing levels of anxiety. She had talked to her parents about it as well, and they said that maybe she should get some help. 
She actually told her dad that she wants to quit her job and move back home, but that the wedding was still going to happen. It raised some concern in him because he didn't know her like that. And her parents also said she was usually very bubbly, very happy, and she seemed to be slowly but surely shutting down and withdrawing and just something was off. Her dad encouraged her in his wisdom to keep her job and to just take everything one day at a time. And her mom encouraged her to go and see a psychiatrist, which she then did. Her psychiatrist, Dr. Berman, had prescribed her with some medication, including clonopin, Zoloft and Xanax, which are all anxiety treatment medications, as well as Ambien to help her get some good sleep for once. Dr. Berman has maintained throughout this case when asked about Ellen's mental state at the time, that Ellen was not suicidal, that she was stressed, that she was anxious, but not suicidal. On January 26th, 2011, Ellen had spoken to her mom on the way to school and she talked about taxes. She said, well, tax season is upon us. She's got lots of things to sort out, lots of paperwork and things to get her taxes in order. Once she was at school and teaching classes for the day and then that blizzard rolled in as it did and classes were canceled, Ellen made sure that every single child in her class got home safely, she waved goodbye, all the parents uh, came to pick up the kids, and then she got in her car and headed home. So her and Sam were at home in their sixth floor apartment. And then Sam, at around 4.50 p.m., decided he's gonna go hit the gym. Now this uh, apartment block, this complex, actually had a gym conveniently in the building, so it wasn't like he had to drive anywhere. He was just gonna head downstairs for a workout. Keep in mind that he was wearing Timberland boots for this workout and not any trainers or sneakers or anything like that. Surveillance footage showed that he entered the gym around 4.54 p.m. and that he left the gym at around 5.26 p.m. When he got back to that apartment, and by the way, there's no surveillance uh, cameras in the hallways leading up to the apartment doors. When he got back there, he knocked on the door and tried to jiggle it open and he was like, oh, the door's locked. That's so weird. They only normally do that at night. So then he started texting Ellen. This is what he said on text. Hello, open the door. What are you doing? I'm getting pissed. Hello, you better have an excuse. What the fuck? You have no idea. Sam then says, after about an hour, which is very hard for me to imagine. That's what he says, but based on the timeline, it's not quite an hour. You'll see in a moment. But after about an hour, he went downstairs to talk to the security guard of the complex, 67-year-old Phil Hanton, asking him to help uh, break through the door because he couldn't open the door and he knew that his fiancée was inside. Phil told him he couldn't do that. That was against uh, policy for safety reasons. Now, Sam's story has always been that Phil eventually agreed to come along with him to go upstairs and watch him at least kick down that door, break into the apartment. But as it later turned out, Phil said, uh, no, he was at his desk all day. He never went upstairs with him and he did not enter the apartment with Sam. Also note the only damage to the door was with that swing lock. So this door was not locked um, just like as in a locked door. It was that like a hotel room, you know, that little swing lock thing. It was locked like that, which just bear in mind, if you're thinking that no one can do that themselves, like from the outside, there are videos on YouTube that show you exactly how to do that. And it, it's really not rocket science. You know, it's it's pretty easy to do. And it's actually pretty scary if you do watch those videos um, because of all my time as a pilot spending, you know, many years of my life really living in hotels. I was always making sure that the rooms I was in was super secure. I've always been safety conscious, okay? So... I do know that people can actually break into your room by even if they open the door and that swing door lock, um, you know, it opens it just a bit. There's a way with like an elastic band to actually open that that swing lock. Never mind that then it would also be the other way around that you could get that swing lock to lock from the outside if you do certain tricks, which you can learn on YouTube easily, right? Disclaimer. I'm not encouraging anyone to learn these tricks. I'm saying it's possible that uh, Ellen was not the one to lock the door like that. Now, what's interesting is with Sam breaking into this door and we're going to get to what he found with that. He didn't kick down the door. The only damage to the door was actually on the 
the area where there's little screws in the door where the swing lock attaches to, there was one screw missing and there was a little bit of damage there. And that screw was never found. I hope you're writing all this down because there's quite a lot of red flags. Now, no one in this case is considered a suspect because this is a suicide case. So there's never been a luminal test. There's never been a suspect even considered in this case. But in my mind, there's a couple of things here that are very, very odd. Now, Sam entered the apartment and said that he was shocked at what he saw. Ellen was propped up, as in sitting up against a, a cabinet in the kitchen. And later it was discovered that there was a knife plunged into her chest. But if we listen to the 911 call, it's as if he discovered that only halfway through trying to resuscitate her. Oh, I, I, I need, I need a, I need a, I need a, I just walked to my apartment. My fiance is on the floor with blood everywhere. What is the address? 4601 Flat Rock Road. Please come, help, 40 now. 4601 Flat Rock Road. Is this a house or apartment? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. It's an apartment. It's an apartment. What apartment number? <laughs> Please hurry, Where please. Where is she bleeding from? She, I don't know. I can't tell. She's... No. So you have to calm yourself down in order to get you some help. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She... Okay. I don't know. I, I'm looking at her right now. She... I don't... I can't see anything. She didn't... There's nothing broken. She's bleeding. Ellie... You don't know where she's bleeding from, can't you? Ellie, where the coming from? It's, I think her head. I think she hit her head, I think. I think but it's, not, it's everywhere. Okay, it's everywhere. I think she might have fallen. Do you know yeah. what happened? Uh, she, she, she may have slipped his blood on the on the table. Her, her face is a little purple. Okay, hold on for rescue for her. Stay on the phone. Fire department 842, what's the address? No, uh, 4601 Flat Rock Road, please hurry. 4601 Flat Rock? Yes. What's wrong? My, my, I just, my, I went downstairs to go work out. I came back up, the door was latched. My fiance's inside, she wasn't, she wasn't answering, so after about a half hour, I decided to break it down. I see her now just on the floor with blood. She's not, she's not responding. Okay, is she breathing? She, I, <laughs> Look at her chest. I need you to calm down, and I need you to look at her chest. It's really. I don't think she. I really don't think she is. Listen to me. Someone's on the way. Look at her chest. Is she flat on her back? <laughs> She's on her back. So okay, I her. Look at her chest and tell me if it's going up and down, up and down. I don't see her moving. Okay. Do you know how to do CPR? I don't. Okay. I can tell you what to do. Okay. Until they get there, I want you to keep her. Oh her God. Back. Hello. Yeah, hi, okay. Are you willing to do CPR with me over the phone so they can I, get I, I have to, right? Okay, so get her flat on her back, bare her chest, okay? You want to rip her shirt off. <laughs> okay, you need to kneel down by her side. Oh, my God. Allie, please. Listen, listen, you can't freak out, sir, because you're Okay, I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to. Her shirt won't come off, it's a zipper. Rip oh, my off. God, she stabbed herself. Where? She fell in a knife. Oh, no, her knife's sticking out. Oh, uh, what? There's a knife sticking out of her heart. Oh, she stabbed herself? I, can't, I guess so. I don't know where she fell on it. I don't know. Okay, well, don't touch it. Okay, Believe so I'm just, I'm just let her down. Here now? I mean, what do I do? No, I mean, you can't. If the knife is at her chest, it's going to be kind of hard for you to do CPR at this time. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Police with shop reader. 277. Is All someone right. coming here? Yes, they are. You said 4601 Flat Rock, right? Yes. Okay, someone's on the way, and the knife is still inside? Wait, your what? The knife is still inside of her? Yes, I didn't take it out. Is it her chest or what area? It's, it's in her heart. chest. It's it's like, it looks like it's right. It looks like it's right in her heart. Okay, someone's on the way out there. Okay, just get Oh, my door. God. Oh, my God. How okay. old is she? 27. 27. And there's no sign of life at all? I don't. No, please don't. What? And turn to her arm and tell me if she responds to pain. Ellie! It's not, it's not her arm, her hands are still warm. I don't know if that means whatever, I mean. I know, but you can't, and the knife is still inside of her. How far? Can you see how far it went in? It looks pretty deep. Okay. It looks three inches a long night. Don't touch anything. Yeah, don't touch anything. Okay. I don't touch anything. I can't believe this, though. So wait, it was just you there with her? We, yeah, we're the only ones here. 
And she ran in the door. You said lamps sit shut. No, no, I, I, I went downstairs to work out. And like when I came back up, the door was locked. Uh, uh, wasn't like it was selling the clock to the inside. And I'm yelling. And I'm telling, telling well, was your house broken into? No, 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 no. So there's no sign of a break-in? No, no sign of a break-in at all. Uh, there will be when you get to the break uh, left, but... Okay, 4601 Flat Rock, and this is a house, right? Uh, Flat Rock, yeah. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. All right. Okay, mm-hmm. All right. So that's interesting too, but let's carry on. So it was clear that when he walked in, he saw a lot of blood in the kitchen, her propped up against the cabinet. He said that, you know, she'd been attacked and it looked like she wasn't breathing, like she was deceased, right? There was a fresh fruit salad that Ellen had started to prepare, just sitting on the counter as in freshly washed blueberries and sliced oranges, and there were also two clean knives in the sink. There was no sign of forced entry, except of course, just the damage to the door from Sam forcing his way in, but nothing else. And oddly, in Ellen's hand, there was a super clean white towel. That is odd. If I've ever heard of a staged crime scene, yeah, this is it. At 6.14 p.m., Sam called his uncle, James Schwartzman. Now, he's apparently a very important political figure in Philadelphia, and he just so happens to be a very powerful attorney. So he calls his uncle first, as well as his cousin, who's the uncle's son, alerting them to what he had found, and then he called 911. At 6.28 p.m., Sam is seen on camera for the last time. It was at 6.31 p.m., that Sam called 911 and emergency responders were dispatched to the scene. By 6.40 p.m., Ellen Greenberg was pronounced dead at the scene. And her cause of death, based on what the medical examiner found, was initially ruled as a homicide. So let's uh, back up again and go over who the uncle and the cousin so James Schwartzman is a very important political figure and attorney in Philadelphia and is currently the president judge of the Pennsylvania Court of Judicial Discipline. James and Camion returned to the apartment the next day. Why? Well, just to take possession of Ellen's personal laptop, work laptop, cell phone and Sam's work laptop. Police reviewed surveillance footage and found that there was no sign of anyone suspicious entering or leaving the apartment complex in the window of time that this incident occurred. When they asked neighbors if they heard any noise or, you know, did, did anything suspicious happen that you saw, they said there was nothing suspicious. The only thing they could hear was Sam knocking on the door and then eventually breaking into the apartment. Okay, so trigger warning. This content, all of it, of course, is for adults only. But now we're going to be discussing Ellen Greenberg's injuries. So if that's something that's too much for you, then either review the timestamps to skip forward to the next part, or I'll see you in the next video. So Ellen had no defense wounds. There was no blood found anywhere but in the kitchen, exactly where Ellen was found. The knife only had Ellen's DNA on it. There were eight stab wounds to Ellen's chest. Some of them were only 0.2 inches deep. Some of them were much deeper. And she also had a two inch stab wound to her stomach. There was also a two and a half inch gash on her scalp. Now get this, she had 10 stab wounds to the back of her neck. Some of these wounds, medical examiners and consultants later looking at the case as well, they confirmed that some of those wounds would have severed nerves that would make it impossible for Ellen to continue stabbing herself after that if she had done this herself, which who really believes that? The point is, if those nerves were severed, she wouldn't have had the strength or the coordination to stab herself in the chest after that because that was determined to be the fatal stab. Interestingly, there was also blood 
on Ellen's left cheek that went horizontally. It was dried that way. And so if she was sitting propped up the entire time, how would that really happen? So it really implies that uh, she had been lying down and then had been propped up after that blood had dried. Also, her injuries later were proven to have been caused by two knives, a smooth one and a serrated one, especially the gash on her scalp. Medical examiners said that that was caused by a serrated knife. A serrated knife has never been found in this case. There was also blood found on Ellen's Ugg boots, which would suggest that she was standing when she was attacked in order for the blood to be on her boots like that. Because how she was found, propped up against the cabinet, was with her legs out in front of her. So therefore, the blood wouldn't have been there if she had attacked herself sitting like that. It's been speculated that this was what one would call a blitz attack, which is when someone attacks you from behind and so fast that you you literally cannot respond. It is so violent, so rapid, there's no time to respond and there would be no defensive wounds. On Ellen's right arm, abdomen and leg, there were bruises and some of them were in different stages of healing, meaning they were older bruises from the weeks before this. Sam said that those bruises were caused by Ellen's uh, participation in yoga and Pilates classes. And Ellen's dad says that's not possible because she didn't take yoga or Pilates classes. So the medical examiner initially ruled Ellen's death a homicide. But in February 2011, based on coercion by the police, this was changed to suicide. There was never a luminal test done, so it was never proven that perhaps someone had even cleaned up the scene as they staged it and perhaps put a pristine white towel in Ellen's hand because that's quite odd as well. That's actually the most odd thing for me is that. Never mind the, the stabs to the back of her neck, which she wouldn't have been able to do herself. Pittsburgh forensic pathologist Cyril H. Wecht, who famously challenged the single bullet theory of the John F. Kennedy assassination, reviewed the case and determined it was strongly suspicious of homicide and also stated, I don't know how they wrote this off as suicide. Similarly, forensic scientist Henry Lee, who testified for the defense in the O.J. Simpson murder trial, reviewed the case files and concluded the number and types of wounds and bloodstain patterns observed are consistent with a homicide scene. One significant point of contention were the stab wounds that penetrated Ellen Greenberg's brain. Dr. Wayne K. Ross wrote that the stab wounds to the brain and spinal cord would have caused severe pain, cranial nerve dysfunction, and traumatic brain injuries. The original medical report stated that the neuropathologist Dr. Lucy Rourke Adams determined there was no such wound. However, when interviewed by the Philadelphia Inquirer, Dr. Rourke revealed um, she didn't actually observe Greenberg's body and confirmed she has no records of the examination. In October 2019, Ellen's parents filed a civil suit against the Philadelphia Medical Examiner's Office and Dr. Marlon Osborne, the pathologist who conducted the autopsy in the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas. All that they want is justice for their daughter and for her death to be ruled either as undetermined or a homicide. To me, it's shocking that the courts at this point and this entire case, they won't even consider ruling her death undetermined, which is still tragic enough. Because to me, it sounds a lot like a homicide. Dr. Osborne, the medical examiner who initially ruled her death a homicide, admitted to changing the manner of death at the insistence of the police. A new technology called photogrammetry, which was not available at the time of Ellen's death, created a 3D anatomical recreation of Ellen's wounds, demonstrating that not all 20 wounds could be self-inflicted. In January of 2020, the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas allowed the case to proceed past the motion to dismiss stage. So that was a big win for Ellen's family. 
In August of 2022, the Chester County DA's office announced that it would reopen the investigation into Ellen's death. Also, a forensic examination of Ellen's computer showed that there were search terms such as painless suicide, quick suicide, methods of suicide that were searched on her computer. Sam has never spoken to the media about Ellen's case and he has since gotten remarried and has two children. He was in contact with Ellen's parents for about two years following her death and then after that the last communication he had with them was to say that he's moved on. Now I have lots and lots of documents in this case. If you would like me to read through some of those leave a comment below. Now what can you do to help Ellen's parents uh, fight for justice for her? You can follow their Facebook page, which I have linked everything in the description box for you. You can sign the petition. That would be very, very helpful. And then there's also a GoFundMe that you can donate to because I'm pretty sure that if this case does go to trial, which has been delayed and delayed, but her parents are not giving up, that is going to be quite a costly exercise. Let me quickly read you this article by the New York Post, and this was from November 16th, 2022. Ellen Greenberg's family seeks to overturn ruling she committed suicide after being stabbed 20 times. For more than a decade, the family of a woman stabbed 20 times, including 10 from behind, has battled to have the Philadelphia medical examiners ruling that her death was a suicide overturned. Ellen Greenberg, a 27-year-old teacher, was found covered in bruises and stabbed to death in her apartment during a blizzard more than a decade ago. Despite the blood-soaked crime scene, evidence her body had been moved and stab wounds to the back of her skull, investigators found no evidence of a struggle in the kitchen area or anywhere else in the apartment. Dr. Marlon Osborne, a former pathologist at the medical examiner's office in Philadelphia, initially ruled the death a homicide based on the injuries, then backtracked and revised the manner of death to suicide after conferring with city police, according to a civil lawsuit from Greenberg's family. An appeals court heard arguments in a civil lawsuit this week and will decide whether it can move to trial. Lawyers on both sides of the appeal made their cases before a three-member panel of the Commonwealth Court Tuesday, Joe Podraza, an attorney for the Greenberg's parents, told Fox News Digital. We are cautiously optimistic that the panel will find the estate of Ellen Greenberg may proceed to trial on her mandamus and declaratory actions against the city of Philadelphia and Dr. Osborne so that the manner of her death may be changed from suicide to something else, he said. Only then can we begin to secure justice for Ellen. He said he expects the panel to reach a decision in the next three to six months. The judges were all well prepared and versed about the issues, he said. The judges also displayed the proper degree of sympathy over Ellen's death and the terrible circumstances surrounding her death. Greenberg's fiance Sam Goldberg called police on January 26, 2011 to report coming home to find her dead in the kitchen of their Philadelphia apartment, according to court documents. According to Podraza, evidence shows that at least two of the stab wounds were inflicted after Greenberg's heart stopped beating. Multiple investigators who reviewed the case told Fox News Digital they disagree with Osborne's findings. I was startled by the amount of questions that remained. Guy D'Andrea, a former homicide prosecutor with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, told Fox News Digital in September. Before leaving the DA's office, D'Andrea performed a review of the case and said he believed at minimum the cause of death should have been undetermined. Reviewing the file and crime scene photographs and the medical examiner's photographs, I don't know how you come to that conclusion of a suicide, he said. Four key pieces of evidence caused him to doubt Osborne's finding of suicide, he said. A wound to the top of her head, the fact that she was found seated upright but blood had dripped sideways across her face, indicating that she had been moved. A large amount of bruises at different stages of healing. And the fiancé's claim that he broke the locked door down when... Crime scene photos show the latch still attached to both the door and the frame. Several forensic pathologists, including Dr. Cyril Wecht, one of the country's leading experts in the field, reviewed Dr. Osborne's findings over the years and found the circumstances strongly suspicious of homicide. In all my years of my experience and all the homicides that I've done and suicides, I've never seen anything like this. But city officials maintain a comprehensive investigation found no evidence of a homicide. 
separately after referrals back and forth regarding the case between the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office and the State Attorney General, the Chester County District Attorney's Office has assigned an investigator and a prosecutor to conduct an outside investigation into Greenberg's manner of death. We will have to wait for the Chester DA's response to know the next steps, Podraza said of those proceedings. If she finds a basis to proceed with a homicide investigation, we will have to see if her office keeps it. It goes back to Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Kresner or a special prosecutor is assigned. Let me know what you think about the outcome of this case so far. And I really do hope that you will help in signing the petition so that the family can be shown maximum support. As I say, I do have a lot of documents that we could go over if you wanted to. So let me know in the comments below as well. If I do decide to do that, I'll probably first do an early release on Patreon or membership. So if you are interested in that, please check that out as well. And thank you so much to everyone who is already a Patreon member. Your support means the world to me. Oftentimes, these documents are pretty pricey. Some courts charge a dollar per page. So... Thank you so much for making it possible for me to even invest in documents like this. I will keep you posted and I will see you in the next one. Stay safe.